a lot I would like to forget. No, you were right, Raven. This is not a time for sleeping. This is a time for talking. See, I've got something I want to talk about, too. What? About a man named Jeff. Jeff Brown. Jeff Brown? The man that died in the plane crash? Yes, there was someone who died in that plane crash, Raven, but... Uh, well, you know more about my friend than you're letting on, don't you? What do you mean? You know, when I lived in a hotel, I didn't keep these pictures and papers, memorabilia with me. They were locked up in a warehouse, but... When I bought this house, I thought it would be safe to have them with me, that I could keep them locked up here. It was crazy of me to think that I could keep my secret from you, from my own wife. It wasn't hard with Martine or Gunther or dear old Aunt Geraldine. The aunt who isn't really my aunt. So it's true. Oh, you knew that, of course. You've known it for a week or so. Ever since you got into my sanctum sanctorum and saw that photograph of me and Jeff, and that shrewd little brain of yours began to click and put two and two together. What was it that finally did it, Raven? Was it the scar? Yes. And then you began asking questions. And then you asked more questions. Until finally you knew. You know who I am, don't you, darling? Well, I didn't know what to do. I love you, and I... I didn't know who you were. But you do know who I am. This is me. The man that you married. And you're going to be just fine. You're going to live happily ever after, and you're going to be Mrs. Schuyler Whitney for the rest of your life. shock it was for me when I realized that the man who I was married to wasn't really the man I was married to. I didn't even know you. But this is me. You do know me. This is me just the way God created me with a few minor alterations. And then I knew that you had found the key to my study and that you had been uh, prowling around in here. Oh, God, it was so stupid. I, I remember I took the key out and I forgot to put it back. Don't ever go into the espionage business, darling. You'll never make a go of it. And then I kept asking questions about the scar and about the crash and about Dr. Bryson. It was Dr. Bryson who did the surgery. He was a brilliant surgeon and probably the most discreet man I've ever met. You haven't uh, mentioned this to anyone, have you? Your suspicions? No! Of course not. Uh, who could I possibly talk to? Everyone would think I was crazy. And I didn't want to ruin my marriage. Not even to Nancy Carr when you asked her to uh, investigate the facts about the plane crash? No, Nancy Carr just thought I was asking about your past. How about Aunt Geraldine? Well, I wanted to talk to her, and I did try to talk to her, but she was the only one I felt that I could talk to. Is that why she came over here tonight, so you could talk? Yes, but she didn't know what I wanted to talk about, and I didn't even know she was coming. She said she was going to work late. Yes, I remember. I wanted to talk to you. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to run up to you and beg you please to tell me the truth. Why didn't you? I was afraid. Of me? Yes. I didn't know what you would do. And I didn't want to risk my marriage and lose everything I had. Just as I didn't want to lose everything that I had. Including you. 
Well, tell me. Tell me the story. How did you become Skylar Whitney? Well, it was one of those golden opportunities, something that happens once in a lifetime. It was the chance to become everything I'd always wanted to be. You always wanted to be Skylar Whitney? No, no. I despised the original. He was a sheltered, greedy, pompous, self-important child. Oh, but he had one marvelous attribute, Raven. He had money. He had great stacks of money. Huge pyramids of money. Enormous skyscrapers of money. The man was as rich as Croesus. And you wanted to live his life? No, no. I wanted to live my life. Jeff Brown's life in here. And in the study? Yes. It's very perceptive of you. I wanted some place where, well, Jeff Brown could really live, where he could relax. That's why I had pictures of friends, old letters, my high school yearbook, things like that inside. Links with my past. You know, it was, uh, it was tough to give up that face with this one. I remember the first time I saw it. Where? Switzerland. Sky was there for three months. We had time to kill. We had a lot in common. We were the same age, same height, same general build. We both loved to ski. And we both loved to live like millionaires. But you see, there was the significant difference. You see, he really was a millionaire many times over. And Jeff Brown, Jeff Brown was a pauper. So you became his friend? He had three months to kill waiting for all of that inheritance to land in his lap. He told me about it the first day I met him. Not that he was lacking for funds at the time. I mean, he had enough money to rent the entire chalet. Jeff Brown couldn't even afford a single room. So how did you manage it? There was only one way that a man like Skylar Whitney could make friends. He had to buy them. There you are, little boy. Won't you take this and pay that nasty man his room rent so we can get out of this mausoleum? Sure. Where did you want to go? Well, got some friends who've got a chateau with a heated swimming pool. And I'd like to go check out the bathing suits the ladies are wearing this year here. They're positively scandalous. Sounds good to me. I know one cute little blonde I'd like to invite from the hotel. Which one is that? Her name is... Valerie. Valerie Bryson. So you did know that little twerp in Switzerland? Oh, no, no. Skye knew her. She was a very attractive young girl, and Skye felt that every attractive young girl belonged to him. But of course you weren't interested. No. I was curious about her. There was a guest who was staying there who got drunk one night who said that her father was the best friend the underworld ever had. Her father was a crook. Not a crook. A fine surgeon. A man who could change your appearance and never once ask about your motivation. For the right price. I told Skye about the rumor, but he wasn't interested in it. The only thing he was interested in was in Dr. Kenneth Bryson's daughter. But, of course, the rumor was important to you. No. Not until... Not until a plane crash. Not until Skye decided it would be a lot of fun to rent a plane and go over the Alps into Zurich. He wasn't half the pilot that he thought he was. We hit a snowstorm. Down drifted hundreds of feet, and we must have hit the top of a tree. Something had lost the propeller. Sky. Sky. Sky, where are you? dead, really. But 
but I was only bruised. And I got out of there just in time before the snowstorm carried the wreckage of the plane and his body into a mountain crevice. Oh, my God. I took everything with me that I could carry, <laughs> including his money belt. That man actually wore a money belt. Do you know how much money he carried around with him? He had almost a hundred thousand dollars in large bills. How did you stay alive? I think it was the money that kept me alive. I mean, I couldn't eat it, but it did keep me warm. And then I searched around until I found an empty Swiss guide's cabin. And I stayed there, I don't know how many days, trying to think of what I was going to do next. And then I got my idea. I knew what my next stop was going to be. It would be Lucerne and the clinic of Dr. Bryson. You know, at first I couldn't even stand the thought of her coming over here to this house and hopping in like she was a neighbor coming for a cup of coffee, particularly after all the torment that her father put you through. I, I'm, I'm sorry. But after a while, you realized that it wasn't Valerie's fault. Yeah, sure, I cooled down finally, but I certainly wouldn't say that I liked her. She's awfully pretty, or didn't you notice? Yeah, sure I did. But it took me a long while before I started seeing her as anything but the daughter of Dr. Kenneth Bryson. Well, Kelly, you know, I think there's another reason for your behavior towards Valerie. I think you were feeling disloyal to Judy. No. That's... that's... Yeah. That is true. Yeah, I, I guess I did. You know, the first day I went over to the photography studio to, to see Val, to apologize to her for the way I'd been treating her. I remember as I was climbing the stairs, a thought crossed my mind that I was only a block away from the dance studio, from where Jody was practicing. But that didn't stop me, because I wanted to see Val more. Kelly, don't feel guilty about that, because affections do change sometimes. And Nancy, we have so much in common. She's so easy to talk to, just like you are, and I... I've been talking your ear off for an hour now. What, what time is it? Oh, it's after one o'clock, my goodness. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean oh. to keep you up so late. No, 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 no. It's all been worthwhile if it helped you feel better. Well, sure, it made me feel better, but it's not gonna make you feel better tomorrow morning. Well, I wonder if we've kept Valerie awake tonight. How do you mean? Her ears must be burning. <laughs> yeah, I guess they are. You know, Valerie told me that she's been having trouble, uh, sleeping most nights. I'm sorry to hear that. And I know one thing that's going to be keeping her awake tonight. She's going to be trying to figure out exactly what those mysterious numbers mean in her father's letter. I wish there was some way we could figure it out. Hey, listen, when can we uh, ask Mike about contacting Draper Scott and that investigating team of his? Well, first thing in the morning, if we're up early enough. Oh, right. It's time to call the night. All right. Sleep well, dear. Good night, Nancy. Good night. somewhere, doesn't it? And why not in a bank account? And why not in Switzerland, where your father founded his clinic? And why shouldn't you be the beneficiary? Because I really don't want to be the beneficiary of illegal money. I mean, sure, I could use a bigger apartment. Yeah, but if these are numbers to a bank account, you're going to be able to afford to buy a duplex. I wouldn't want that. I get nervous enough by myself in this little place. Nervous? What about? You'd have to be a girl living alone in the city, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. I forgot about that. Mr. Val, if I was you, I, I'd, I'd be careful. I am, Kelly. I mean, look at the lights. No, no, no. I, I mean, uh, careful about this. What do you mean? Well, I wouldn't tell anyone what we think those numbers mean. There might still be people out there interested in what your father did. <laughs> so you think I'm still in danger from my father's uh, ex-patients? You know, I'm not sure I ever really was. Yeah, but your father thought so. He thought that they'd use you against him to maintain his silence. Kelly, his silence is assured. Yeah, of course, but there still might be people out there that think that you have information about them. Information passed on by your father. You know, Kelly, if you're trying to get me scared, you are really doing a good job of it.
That's right. I was wearing bandages when I arrived at the clinic. I didn't want anyone to recognize Jeff Brown. So I became Lieutenant James Diedrichson, <laughs> war hero. That's who Dr. Bryson believed you were. Dr. Bryson never asked me one single question. Oh, no, no, that's not, that's not entirely true. He did ask me how much I could pay. And I told him that money was no object, as long as I got a new face. This face. Obviously, you had a picture of the real scar. Yeah, I had a few, including that famous picture by the swimming pool that has changed our lives so much. So you went through all of this for... For what? 30, 40, 50 million dollars. I mean, I didn't even know the extent of poor Sky's fortune, but I did know that if I could pull this off, I would be a very wealthy man for the rest of my life. There wasn't a dead ringer for Sky, but people who knew me slightly would never know the difference. Especially after the plane crash. Of course. They would all figure it was from the accident. That's right. See, even the little scars that were left from the operation, they could be easily explained away. But the most important thing was that the people who knew Sky well, I mean the people here in Monticello, hadn't seen him in 14 years. And he only had one living relative, one dear old aunt. Geraldine, <laughs> and you fooled her. You bet I fooled her, just as I fooled all those bankers and the lawyers. You know, I'd be surprised how well people treat you when you've got money, Raven. It, it may be the single most important attribute of wealth. And I knew if I could fool Geraldine, I would have it made. I'd be Skylar with me for the rest of my life. If she only knew. And dear old Skye, he loved to talk about his aunt and her remarkable family. And then again, she was a, a very public person. I had no trouble finding out anything I needed to know. <laughs> there were one or two faux pas. Like what? Well, like when I first told Geraldine that I was going to buy the mansion, I said, you know, and I could hardly remember what it was like. She reminded me that I had never set foot in it. It was only a minor matter. It didn't make her alarmed. And you got away with it. Yes, I did. And you know, after the first couple of weeks, it was... It was no longer a masquerade. I mean, I really began to feel like Sky with me. Does he haunt you? I mean, do you think about him? Out there in the snow? Or even he was dead. I mean, he was dead out there, dead and buried. And I was alive. This would have been. I mean, all this. All the Whitney millions. I mean, most of it would have gone to the government. And he was dead as a mackerel! Oh, no. I couldn't let all this estate remain untouched by human hands. I mean, let it go to the government for sir, to build highways or, or ballistic missiles or something. I mean, how could I do that? You couldn't! And you didn't, and you did the right thing, and I love you! You're wonderful! <laughs> And we, we are going to take the world for a ride. <laughs> what would have happened. I mean, all this, all the Whitney millions, they, they would have gone to waste. Most of it would have gone to the government. Now, how could I have let that happen? I mean, he was dead, dead and buried. But his fortune was here, unused, untouched by human hands. Now, my God, Raven, how could I let all that beautiful money go to waste? I mean, how could I let it go to the government so they could build uh, highways or ballistic missiles or God knows what else? I mean, how could I do that? You couldn't and you didn't. You were right. You're wonderful. I love you. And we, we are going to take the world for a ride. 
right, now, wait a minute. Right, just wait a minute, wait a minute now. Do you know what you're saying? I mean, you know the truth now, so if we'd agree to some pact of secrecy, that means that you're an accomplice. It's all right. I'm with you. A while ago, I... I did some bad things involving my son in order to get a fortune, so I understand you, and I love you for it! Oh, my God. I was such a fool. I should have told you about it right from the start. Well, why didn't you? What did you think I was gonna do? Go run to the police screaming imposter? I love you! And I also love money. You know, from the first time we met, I knew that we were exactly alike. And we both love to practice the fine art of high living. So let's practice till we get it right. <laughs> mm. It's such a relief to have somebody to talk to to tell my secret to. Oh, it must have been terrible. <sighs> yeah, well, at least now you know where I had my secret study. So that you could be Jeff Brown once in a while? Yeah. I couldn't just forget about it. Well, your secret is safe with me. Well, I should hope so, because it is just as important to you now as it is to me. I won't tell a soul. Oh, I do love you, Mrs. Whitney. Mm. Don't answer right. it. Don't answer it. <laughs> Hello? Is this Mr. Whitney? This is Miles Cavanaugh. Oh, uh, Dr. Cavanaugh. Uh, yes, yes, we've been waiting to hear from you. I'm calling from Monticello, General. Uh, your aunt insisted that I contact you to let you know that she was all right. Oh, thank God for that. We were very worried about it. As a matter of fact, we were just talking about it. Yes, well, she suffered a concussion, so she's going to be under observation for a few days, but she should be as good as new. Uh, look, hold on for a second, will you? Look, I don't want you doing any, any talking. Now, I'm filling in your nephew on your condition, uh, as I promised. I want to talk to him now. It's not a good idea, but all right. No more than two minutes. Scott, huh? how are you? Oh, Geraldine, well, I'm, uh, I'm fine. I'm a little shaken up, I guess. But the important thing is, how are you? Well, my dear, I have a monumental headache. But Miles assures me that I'll be back to normal in a few days. Now, what about Raven? Is she all right? Oh, yeah, well, she's fine. She's uh, worried sick about you, that's all. Is she there? Sitting by my side. Put her on, dear. Mrs. Whitney, it is our Auntie Geraldine. I appreciate your concern, Raven. It's nice to know that you're thinking of me. When I came out of the bedroom and down the stairs and saw you lying there, I thought that he had killed you. <laughs> when I regained consciousness, my first thought was that he might have done away with you. <laughs> well, I'm glad we were both wrong, aren't you? I, uh, I guess I should let you just rest. Yes, I'm really very tired. I have the feeling when I finally do close my eyes, I'm going to sleep for the next two days. Well, if that's what it takes to make you better, then that's what you should do. Uh, I'm afraid I have to get off the phone, Raven. It's the doctor's orders. Well, all right. Look, I'll come see you tomorrow and, and rest well, and I love you. Goodbye, dear. Bye-bye. Raven, I'm sorry to cut your conversation short. we got to let Geraldine get some rest. Okay. Well, uh, how is she? Is she all right? Yeah, the prognosis is very good. Good. Look, if there's anything I can do, you just let me know. Well, once she's released from the hospital, she'll need some tender loving care. Right now, we're keeping an eye on her. Well, you make sure that whatever she wants, she gets. All right, suppose I just put a note at the top of her chart saying only the best for this lady. She means a lot to me, too, you know. Good. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Miles. I just wanted Raven to know that I was all right. Well, now that uh, I've done something for you, I expect you to return the favor. I want you to lie back. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to let sleep come. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not in any condition to do anything but to comply. Is there anybody else you want me to notify? I'll do that for you. No, there's no one else, Miles. 
Just as long as Scarlett and Raven know, I have no other family. Geraldine, considering all the people who care about you, you're the biggest family in Monticello. It's a very interesting story, Sammy. Why don't you tell it to us once more? Let's see if it sounds just as stupid this time. What are you guys wasting time on me for, huh? And I'm small potatoes. You were small potatoes, Sam, until you decided to snatch Raven Whitney's purse. You're in way over your head, boy. I think your only way out is to be honest with us. I keep telling you, I didn't really snatch that lady's purse. Why do you insist on sticking to that fairy tale? We've got you dead to rights on this okay, thing. Okay, I was there. What I mean is I, I didn't do it for me, you know? So it shouldn't count as much, right? Look, I know you're speaking English, so why don't I understand what you're saying? Romeo laid a hundred bucks on me and told me what to do. It was his plan. Come on, why would a punk like Romeo pay you to snatch someone's purse? Now, what were you doing in front of that dress shop? She was just standing there looking in the store window and her purse was hanging from her hand. Must have been a piece of cake for you. So you just decided to uh, saunter on over and snatch it, is that correct? Right. And I headed into this alley with Romeo on my tail. Just like you planned it. He told me to wait for him there, so that's what I did. Anyway, I gave him the purse, and he pretended to mess me up a little bit. Then I made my escape, and Romeo took the purse back and made out he was a hero with the lady. You're lying, Sammy. That's all there was, Stoner. Look, are you sure you don't want to backtrack a little bit and fill us in on something you left out? Like what? Like what you took out of that purse. I didn't touch a cent. But you did take her house keys, didn't you? You took it to a locksmith, and you had a duplicate set made, and you gave them to your pal Romeo. Isn't that true? I figured that's how he uh, scored with all those ladies. Come on in. I hope I'm not interrupting. What do you got, Tyler? I've been checking some things out. Sky's story seems to fit the facts. Now, wait a second, wait a second. Take him down, book him, print him, have photographs right. taken. Right. Come on, let's go. All right. You verified he was in Chicago on business, had Gunther with him? That appears to be the case. I did find something pretty interesting, though. What? When Sky Whitney returned to Monticello tonight, he chartered a private two-seater jet. He left Gunther behind to take a commercial flight that came in much later. <laughs> Sounds like the man was in a hurry to get back to town. All right, I think we're gonna have to get Gunther down here, see if he can shed some light on all this. I thought you might say something like that, Chief, so I picked Mr. Wagner up at the airport. He's right out here. What do you stand there for? Bring him in. Wait a second, thought. Take him up to my office. I'll interrogate him there. Back into the Whitney house, and uh, Mr. Whitney blew him away with a shotgun, huh? Well, don't that beat all. You know, Mr. Whitney's not the violent type. He must have been really wired up to get up the guts to even pull the trigger. Come on, Gunther, what about it? You ever seen that face before? Familiar to me, yeah. Where and when, Gunther? Well, this man you call Slade dropped by the house this afternoon. What? Yeah, I said he found Mrs. Whitney's house key, so he stopped by to return them. It's very thoughtful of him. I don't get that. Well, obviously, he didn't want Mrs. Whitney to miss the keys, get suspicious, and have all the locks in the house changed. And he probably figured that he'd be invited inside for a cup of tea for his good deed. Once inside, he could check the place out, case his job. Tell me, Gunther, did you ever see this Mr. Slade before you let him in the house? Yeah, I did. Oh, come on, Gunther, just tell us about it. Well, look, don't get the wrong idea, Chief. It's not like I know this character, Slade. I mean, he's not a friend or anything Well, like tell that. us how it was then, Gunther. All uh, right, early this afternoon, I was killing a couple of hours at this bar I like to go to downtown. And I looked up, and what do I see? Off in a corner at a table, but uh, this man Slade and Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? What were they doing together? Beats me. I don't know what a classy woman like uh, Mrs. Whitney is doing in the company of a low life like Slade. So when she got up from the table and left, I went over and asked him. And what did he tell you? Uh, he said that uh, he had retrieved Mrs. Whitney's purse from some punk who had grabbed it. She was buying him a drink. You know, to show her appreciation. Yeah, he created that whole situation just to get his hands on those keys long enough to have duplicates made. <laughs> For all the good it did him. Tell me, Gunther, how do you think it happened that Mr. Slade knew that both of these servants would be out at the Whitney house? 
Listen, if you're referring to me, I didn't tell anyone I went to Chicago. I don't have anyone to tell. It reminds me, Gunter. Have you got any idea how we can reach the, the maid, with Chrissy Nichols? I haven't the slightest idea. You mean she didn't tell you what she was going to do on her night off? All right, Chrissy told me she was going to go visit her mother. But I didn't care enough to find out where the house was. Look, she's due back early in the morning. You can ask her the questions, whatever you want to then. That's if she ever comes back. I'll do a background check on her chief, see if I can find if anything uh, would show that she was involved in this somehow. All right. What are you thinking? It was uh, an inside job. Well, it has been done before, don't there? Yeah. Excuse me, gentlemen. Hope I haven't missed too much. Chief, yeah. I stopped into records and uh, picked up this file on Romeo Slate. Really? Mr. Slade has graced our halls of justice many times, it mm. seems. Aggravated mm. assault, extortion. Yeah, real nice guy. Look at this yellow sheet. He's been ar arrested 12 times, two convictions. But I don't see anything but housebreaking, though. Well, we won't be booking him anymore, Chief, that's for sure. Here's something. He used to go by the nickname Lady Killer. Well, oh, he was almost a bat tonight. Here. I thought you swore off hospitals. Oh, don't laugh. I felt this horrible twinge of anxiety when I walked through the front door. How is she? She's holding her own, happy to say. Oh, that's good to hear. There's no subdural hematoma, so with proper rest and care, she ought to be all right. Oh, good. Can I go see her then? No, no. i uh, afraid I gotta keep you out of there. I don't want her to have any company. Oh, Miles, are you telling me the truth about her condition? Yes, yes, she's gonna be fine. I'll let you see her chart if you want. Oh, I want to see her. Look. Maybe I can be of some comfort to her. Look, I'll just stay one minute, Well, okay? the truth is, sweetheart, the truth is I gave her something to help her rest, so she's probably fast asleep by now, which is the best thing for her. Okay. Oh, it just all seems so terribly unfair. If something like this could happen to Geraldine, she doesn't have an enemy in the whole world. Well, I think her record is unstained on that. I'm sure her assailant didn't mean anything personal. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, it was Raven's house that was robbed. Sort of ironic that Raven got out of this whole mess with nothing more than a bad scare. Why was she in that house all alone? Well, her husband was in Chicago on business. Well, what about Gunther? Where was he? He could scare up a whole army of burglars. Gunther apparently was with his boss in Chicago. Well, what about the other servants? Where were they? Well, there is only one other, and uh, she'd been given the night off. That's great planning. What in the world was Skylar Whitney thinking when he left his wife all alone in that huge house? Well, it could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. Good evening, Mr. Whitney. Hello, Gunther. How's your flight? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. Well, you missed quite a bit of excitement here tonight, Gunther. Uh, so I've heard, sir. The uh, local police informed me, Mr. Whitney. What? Yeah, uh, my plane touched down two hours ago. My first stop was the local police station. Well, why did you go there, Gunther? Well, this detective, Damien Tyler, he met me at the airport. He said I should go downtown with him. And uh, you, you just went with him just like that? <laughs> well, hanging out with a bunch of flatfoots is not my idea of having a good time. But when he asked me to go, I thought it was only correct that I should. And so it was the police who told you about what happened here? Yeah, I was really surprised to find out about it. Mrs. Whitney and Mrs. Saxon were certainly lucky that you returned when you did. Well, what did they want to know? They wanted to know what we were doing tonight. I told them the truth, Mr. Whitney. I told them that we went to Chicago and that you changed your mind about staying, so you returned back here in that private jet. Well, did you tell them why I changed my mind and came back? Well, how could I, Mr. Whitney? You didn't tell me. 
Well, I had a very good reason for coming back, Gunther. It wasn't just a whim. Well, I'm sure you did, Mr. Whitney. When we got there, I got in touch with the plant manager. And he told me that the problems we had gone to take a look at had already been resolved. I'm certainly glad for you, Mr. Whitney. So I canceled the meetings that I had set up. And with the business pressures gone, I found that I was uh, very lonely for my new bride. I was also concerned about her being all alone in this big house. Well, you had reason to worry, as it turned out. That is the reason that I came back, Gunther, to uh, see my wife. Sounds reasonable to me, Mr. Whitney. Gunther, I'm sure that you don't like the idea of people telling tales out of school. Just as I don't like people talking about me behind my back. I didn't say anything out of line tonight, Mr. Whitney. Gunther, if you value your privacy as much as I value mine, you won't talk to anyone, the police or anyone, about me until I allow you to. Understood? I hear you, Mr. Whitney, loud and clear. Good. Going to bed. Uh, good night, Mr. Whitney. I hope you have a very pleasant sleep. Whatever you say goes, my good lord and master, as always. Lady killer, hmm? mistake of my life tonight. Oh, thank God I didn't. Good old Arnie. Two winners and a push. Maybe now his wife won't throw him out. At least this week. Ah, you're taking too much action on the underdog in that fight, Larry. I better call Baltimore and try and lay some of that off. Hello. Hello, hello. This is your very best customer, Gunther. Hey, haven't heard from you in a while. About, about six months. Yeah, well, that last race I bet on at Rockingham Park kind of tapped me out, you know what I mean? Well, you're gonna have to wait for tomorrow to get even. I'm not taking any more bets. Call me in the morning, uh, okay? Well, listen, I don't want to place a bet. I've got a question I think you can answer for me. Look, if you want information, dial operator. I'm busy. Look, it'll only take a minute. Listen, does the name Lady Killer ring a bell with you? Lady Killer. Well, what are we talking about? A filly or a male? What, uh, what track is he running at? I'm not talking about a horse race. I'm talking about a person. A person. Does the name Romeo mean anything to you? Romeo, Romeo. Wherefore? Oh, yeah, well, wait a minute. Now I got it. Uh, Romeo Slade. Yeah, the dude likes to be called a lady killer Slade. So you do know him, hmm? Uh, we met. Let me tell you this. I wouldn't wipe my feet on that bug. Doesn't sound like you like him very much. Well, how are you gonna like a guy who would kill his own grandmother for a dime? That's the kind of creep Slade is. Well, listen, what was his specialty? Burglary? No, nah, not the way I hear it. Slade's specialty is women. Married ones. Oh, really? Well, what is he, some kind of gigolo? No, nothing so respectable. Slade gets rid of women for husbands who don't want them around anymore. That's why they call him Lady Killer. 